Good morning and welcome to Valley View Mennonite Church, our digital service. I want to thank you for tuning in. I also want to thank Rob for giving me the opportunity to share his virtual pulpit for the week. Um, I know that our world is going through some very interesting things, things that we've never really done before. Uh, part of that has been social distancing. Um, for some people, it's been much easier than others. Um, but I was thinking about social distancing, all these steps that we take to help keep ourselves safe and healthy physically. Um, and it made me wonder, well, what are we doing spiritually um, to keep ourselves safe? Um, so this is kind of a play on words, spiritual distancing. Uh, which should not at any point be confused uh, with being spiritually distant. I, I don't think being spiritually distant is a positive thing, and I, I truly hope that that isn't anyone's takeaway from today. Um, so I'm going to take us to Ephesians 5. Um, Ephesians 5, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Whenever you see the word therefore in scripture, it is a stop sign. We need to stop and look back. What comes before the therefore? What precedes therefore? So we'll go back into chapter four. Chapter four, section the new life. Chapter or Verse 25 in chapter four starts with therefore. Having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Now that therefore looks back to Ephesians 4, 17 through 24, which tells us uh, to no longer walk as the Gentiles do. And it uh, expounds on what that means to walk as the Gentiles do. Um, then going on to the end of the chapter uh, to lead to our original therefore from chapter five, it says, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. That is a, a really important concept that we all struggle with is not letting the sun go down on our anger. Um, I get the, the uh, feeling from scripture, there's really actually nothing wrong with getting angry because it tells us we can get angry and not sin. Um, that's a challenge and that's something that we can all uh, aspire to do is to, uh, when we grow angry, to not sin, to not uh, sit and stew in our rage. Um, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So it goes beyond a thief giving up stealing to take care of himself with his own two hands and goes into sharing what he's making with his own two hands. So that's, again, as we proceed to our first therefore. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. I struggle with being incredibly sarcastic, which I didn't consider to be a struggle until very recently. Um, but that doesn't build up. Um, and it doesn't always fit the occasion. And to be quite frank, uh, many people don't understand sarcasm. So I believe I am responsible for what people hear, not just what I say, but what they hear me say. So I'm on a personal journey to try to be less sarcastic, and that's inspired out of that section of Ephesians 4. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. So not only do we not let our, the sun go down on our anger, we forgive each other and we're tenderhearted because we remember that God forgave us through Jesus Christ. So we need to remember to forgive each other quickly, in fact. Before the sun goes down, let's forgive each other and move on. That brings us back to Ephesians 5.1, where we started. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Um, from the photo I added to the screen, um, if you're able to see it, there's a little boy pushing a mower behind his father. And uh, that's one thing that children do 
instinctively as they imitate their fathers. Um, I can remember following my father around. I'm sure that most children, most adults can remember following their fathers around. Uh, sometimes their mothers, but we imitate our parents. Um, so be imitators of God as beloved children. And walk in love. This is actually one of the, it is the greatest commandment. When the teacher of the law came and asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? He said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So we are to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Um, how Christ loved us is the most extreme case of love to, to ever to ever happen that he would take on our sins and to suffer immensely and die. Um, that's the kind of love that Christ had for us. And we're to walk in love in the same way that Christ did. Um, that looks very different than what we think of as love sometimes. If we are giving each other ourselves up for each other, um, that's going to not leave a lot of room for ego. That's something that we can aspire to do, is to walk genuinely with each other and to give ourselves up for one another. Okay, Ephesians 5, 3, and 4. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Crude and coarse joking are such a part of culture and uh, part of our daily lives. And when I think about the, the, the social distancing, that we'd be willing to stay six feet from human beings that we care about in order to not potentially spread a disease to others, would we not want to apply the same kind of care to our spiritual lives where um, maybe the wisdom of that, that church song from, from childhood, the little Sunday school song, be careful little eyes what you see. Uh, what kind of filth do we take in from, from our televisions and our movies and the stand-up comedians that we enjoy or the music that we listen to? And uh, oftentimes as a child of the 90s, I find myself singing along to the radio and uh, a minute or two in, I'll realize that the song that I am, I am just verbally blasting into my steering wheel um, is, is a terrible song. And I never once considered the lyrics growing up, but they're embedded, you know? Um, and I think, I think that that's uh, kind of goes back to this, that uh, just don't engage in the filthy talk and the coarse joking um, if you if you view it as being inappropriate and you allow it to be inappropriate for you, then you can also model that for your children. And before you know it, you've changed the culture of church that we live in uh, to be stronger, to be better. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. So we have a lot of people that, that will tell you many different things uh, to make us feel better about our sin, to, to enable us. And I think we're all guilty of doing that within reason. And, uh, I would challenge everyone else, uh, as we come out of this, this is a different place to be socially, historically, than any of us have lived, for before, lived through before. Um, so this is a great time to examine and to prune ourselves and to see um, that we, we don't need to go back to the way things were. We can improve and we can be better. And uh, we should never be part of deceiving people with empty words. And we shouldn't enable those who do deceive others with empty words. Um, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, you know, this is, this is uh, what God thinks, or God says this. 
And you'll immediately know that that's not in scripture at all. <laughs> You're allowed to challenge that. In fact, we should challenge that. For at one time you were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. And how do we find what is pleasing to the Lord? Um, we learn from scripture that the heart is deceitful beyond all things. So we know that we don't just trust what resonates, what, what feels good. Um, that's a very trendy thing to say is, well, whatever resonates with you. And uh, the Bible actually tells us that the heart is deceitful. So uh, I'm going to go back to the Sola Scriptura. Uh, I, I learned through scripture what God says, and I can pray and I can dwell with God. And I can have a genuine relationship with God. Um, and God has written a beautiful book for us through human authors that tell us, things not as a rule book to tell us how to live but it tells us this amazing law this torah this uh wonderful redemptive law that god gave people and then fulfilled that law through the death and resurrection of jesus christ so uh we can discern what is pleasing to the lord through scripture and because we're able to do that we get to know about god and have a genuine relationship with him uh, in the same way that you can't really know someone until you know about them and adversely, you can know all about someone and never actually know them. So it's actually very important to grow in knowledge, but also to grow in relationship through that knowledge. Ephesians 11 through 13, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful to even speak of the things they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by light, it becomes visible. So, like I said, we're allowed to challenge these things that we see. If you see something that isn't lining up with scripture, it's good to do that in love, in respect. But go to someone and say, you know, I see this and I see this, what it says in scripture, and this isn't lining up. And uh, many of the teachings that are very popular, TV, radio, internet, are heretical. They're, they're not found in scripture whatsoever. And it's perfectly healthy to have different interpretation from scripture, as long as it's grounded in scripture. And it's perfectly healthy to have differing opinions. And we never have to throw people away because they don't agree with us. However, we should always strive to know our God and always strive to teach other people about our God who told us to love our neighbors as ourselves. And if you see someone headed for a pit or headed to fall off a cliff, you're going to tell them that's part of loving them, right? You're not going to kick their legs out from under them, but you're going to tell them. Um, so anything that is exposed becomes visible. And once things become visible, that's when people can become responsible for, to change the situation, right? For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. I've always loved that verse. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. <clears throat> Much of this situation uh, and different conversations that I've had with people have reminded me how much of the mark the church has missed. And that is in Valley View Mennonite Church, or the Methodist Church, or the Baptist Church, or the Catholic Church, or the Lutheran Church. That is the church, the actual body of Christ in the world today has been asleep so much um, when it comes to so many aspects of faith. And that was one of the things that came up in a conversation. Uh, I hated the idea of closing the church for social distancing and going to the, to the virtual services. Um, but I've come around to thinking that that was not a bad idea at this point. That was my own journey, and we won't spend much time on that. Um, however, uh, I've been speaking with a lot of Christians that did not feel it was appropriate to close churches. Um, and their reasoning was great, uh, honestly, is that, well, where are people going to turn? If the churches are closed, where are people going to turn? And uh, they also said, well, I've, I've heard the argument, well, God would protect us if we were going to church. Um, 
and, and several other arguments like that as well, or God just deserves us to gather. Don't forsake the assembly, as it says in Hebrews. Um, so, I mean, a lot of great scriptural arguments for why that this may not have been a good idea, or I'm, I'm not going to argue. I'm really not. Um, but what I, what I did become more aware of is how short we're falling and how disingenuous it seems to me uh, to say things like, well, Jesus healed the lepers. He went right up and he touched the sick and the diseased. And my heartbreak comes in the fact of knowing that we don't do that anyway. So to pretend that that's what we're doing now or wanting to do now, it should hurt us because what this does is it shines a bright light on the fact that we're not praying for the sick and we're not visiting the sick. And are we taking care of the, the orphans and the widows? And are we actually living as Christ? Because most of the arguments for why it was a bad idea to close the church should be shining a spotlight on all the areas that we were missing. Because I think those were great concerns. And what they did for me is they, they made me see how much we're missing just in our uh, normal daily Christian life, Western Christian life. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but wise, making the best use of time because the days are evil. Therefore not be, do, be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Look carefully how you walk not as the unwise, but as the wise. Think of the wisest person that you know and think about how they walk as opposed to how you walk. Now, if you magnify that, the wisest person I know is, is, is not Jesus. Though I know Jesus, but the, the, the wisest person I know in physical form is not Jesus. But there are many different things that I could change about my own walk to emulate them closer. And I would like to walk as the wise and not as the unwise. Making the best use of time because the days are evil. I don't think I even have to expound on that the days are evil. You can look around. You can turn on the TV. You can look at the polarization of politics. You can look at the polarization of any two arguments and how it's become a form of entertainment for so many people and a form of identity. And the days are evil, they truly are. But we need to make the best use of time. Uh, it seems like yesterday that I was 19, my daughter feels like she was born last night, tomorrow I'll be dead. That's how it feels, sometimes. I'm not trying to be morbid. Life is incredibly short. It is wonderful, it's, it's amazing. It's a blessing. Every breath is a blessing. But life is short. We need to make the best time, the best of the time that we have. Because we're not promised tomorrow. Uh, whether we have a pandemic or not, we're not promised tomorrow. We make the best of the time that we have. Always striving. Uh, years ago, when my grandparents were married, the idea, the vision socially was to get married, to have a family, and to build something great. Somewhere along the lines between when my grandma and grandpa got married in 1950 and now, the, the idea, the ideal changed from getting married, having a family, and building something great that would last to I will be great. And that's been a cultural shift. People uh, are less interested in building something wonderful that lasts, but they're looking for glory. And if we can make that shift personally and teach it to our children that I'm not great, I don't need to be great. I need to show everyone who is already great. And that's the Lord. I can, I can point towards God. And if I teach my child to do that within a few generations, maybe we can get back to that ideal of, I'm going to help build something great and not that I'm going to be great. And do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but be filled with the spirit. 
addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. With your heart. Hmm. I know that uh, sometimes I use the, the term Christianese for how Christians speak to each other. It very much is a language that we communicate in. Uh, we say partial Bible verses. We use that old Jewish style of remiz where you reference the verse beside the verse that you mean. Um, but it actually in Ephesians encourages us to speak to each other, to address each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody with our hearts. It should be heartfelt, not just giving the church answer, but giving the church answer if that makes sense. Verse 18 gets weaponized quite a bit. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And you know what? That is absolutely in the Bible. Don't get drunk with wine. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you don't have time for anything else. You shouldn't have time for anything else because we don't have time to waste. I wasn't given any extra time in this life. So whenever someone says, hey, when you get extra time, it's never going to happen. I'm never going to have extra time. You're worth my time. Giving thanks always and for everything to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submitting to one another is a painful, painful thing to try to do. Accountability is hard. Uh, accountability, it is not first nature. Being accountable means that you're submitting yourself. You are opening yourself up and saying, you may criticize what I'm doing. And uh, that is an uncomfortable place to be. Sometimes, sometimes when someone is holding you accountable, it feels like a personal attack. And sometimes when someone says they're holding you accountable, it really is a personal attack. So um, we have to discern things. But if you're in genuine relationship with each other as the church, the people that I go to church with should never be strangers. We should love each other. And as part of that, we should be able to communicate if something's askew or if we don't like what someone is doing, particularly when it affects them and Jesus. It shouldn't be because this annoys me. Uh, a book I read by Ted Tripp, which was all about parenting, shepherding a child's heart, addressed that we have a tendency to punish our children for that which annoys us as opposed to what's damaging to their character. So um, I think we can apply that here too. We should never try to change people simply for what annoys us. We should be trying to help shepherd each other for what's good for them and what's good for Jesus, what's good for the church. And we should submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It isn't because the person is perfect. Nobody's perfect. If you think that someone has it all together, you don't know them well enough yet, right? That is a fundamental truth. It doesn't matter who the person is outside of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter who the person is. They will let you down. And I can say confidently here on camera, I will let you down. I will. If I haven't yet, I will. But uh, let's be quick to forgive each other and not let the sun go down on our anger. So um, I would just like to say that uh, I just took a moment to exegete through uh, most of Ephesians 5, 20 through 21. Um, the next section of Ephesians 5 is fantastic. It applies to husbands and wives. Many of those verses get weaponized, and I would highly encourage you to read those with your spouse if you get a chance this week. But it tells you that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for the church. And it also tells women to submit to their husbands. For he is the head as Christ is the head. But this is actually a relationship that is one of those come under and build each other up relationships. It isn't holding down. It isn't a, a I'm in charge of you, you be quiet kind of relationship. So if you get a chance to with your spouse, I'd highly encourage you to read the end of Ephesians 5 together at some point this week. Um, so I will just take a moment and uh, 
I'll close us in prayer and uh, I hope that you have a wonderful day. So I will go ahead. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity to glorify you in this way, Lord. I pray that you would help us to grow close to one another, although we have to stay physically distant. Father God, I pray that you would bless Valley View Mennonite Church. I pray that you would bless our area. I pray that you would bless the entire region and the state as well, Lord. I pray that you would help us with this pandemic, that we would respond appropriately, whatever that looks like, and that you would give us the wisdom to know how to be your church, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have any prayer requests, feel free to email those to vvmcspartansburg at gmail.com and uh, we'll respond pretty quickly to that. If you uh, have any questions of any other kind, feel free to contact Pastor Rob at his house. That's 814-664-7892. And if you feel led to send tithes, or written prayer requests or any sort of correspondence like that. That's Valley View Mennonite Church, P.O. Box 216, Spartansburg, PA, 16434. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I feel very blessed being able to uh, be a part of this with you. And uh, I pray that you have a beautiful Sunday with your families.